Great. Well, thank you to the Kildare County Council and the Kildare Executive Centenaries Committee for the invitation to speak at this military seminar. Kildare is somewhere that I spend quite a lot of my time, um, whether it's walking along the, the plains of the Curra or on the sideline ship for the Salins Hurler. So um, I'm delighted to be part of the programme. Um, this is part of my PhD research, which I completed last year at Technological University Dublin, formerly DIT. So much of it is based around the case study exhibitions that I examined in my PhD research. So mainly the National Museum of Ireland and the National Gallery of Ireland. But I did hope to include some um, exhibitions from local museums, but unfortunately due to lockdowns and travel, travel restrictions, I didn't get around last year um, as much as I'd have hoped. But um, I do have a new research project where local museums are central. So I look forward to visiting local museums around the country and um, exploring their collections and also the exhibitions that they have to share around the decade of centenaries. Um, also a content warning that this um, seminar does include images of dead bodies such is the nature of the research. Um, so what I want to do today is uh, demonstrate the different ways that the last moments before death manifests in museum displays. And I want to do that by presenting examples from recent exhibitions during the decade of centenaries, because artifacts and images associated with death require careful consideration as to how they are presented to the public in museum environments because death is an inherently problematic experience that all human societies struggle in comprehending. And the inclusion of artifacts and images associated with death have varying curatorial approaches, depending on such influencing aspects, such as generational distance from the subject or event being represented, exhibition space and intended audience. So this image that I'm leading with is a painting by Sean Keating, and it depicts an Irish volunteer awaiting execution in Kilmainham Jail in May of 19, 1916. It featured in the Proclaiming a Republic, the 1916 Rising exhibition, which I'll refer to quite a lot throughout, um, throughout this seminar. That was in Collins Barracks in the National Museum of Ireland in 2016, right up until April of last year. Now, this painting was commissioned by a member of staff of the National Museum, Liam Gogan, he was keeper of Irish antiquities. He commissioned this painting in 1952. The subject is um, Edward Ned Daly of Limerick, and it was painted posthumously from photographs of Ned Daly provided by his family. Now, the, the museum record states that the Capuchin monk beside him is likely to be, be based on Father Augustine. Now, many, the, the leaders of the 1916 Rising, as they awaited their executions, were attended to by, um, by, by priests. And Father Augustine was one of the four priests in Kilmainham Jail um, that morning. But he didn't see Daly on the morning of his execution. Um, it was likely Father Sebastian or Father Columbus. So it, it demonstrates, this painting demonstrates how artifacts become complicated in deciphering the artist's perception of the scene being recorded and the actual reality of that scene. So we as viewers of these artworks and of these museums, museum displays must be aware of the tension between reality and between representation. Now this is a painting that many of you may be familiar with. It's um, a painting by Sir John Lavery um, and it depicts Michael Collins um, as he as he lay uh, lay dead, lay in state, but um, following his assassination, Collins's legacy was claimed with great urgency. There was a really conscious effort to record the visual features of Collins's remains, um, such such as this painting. But it was a, this recording was done so in a way that presented an idealized a romanticized and a viewer friendly version to distract from the violent circumstances of his death. So um, Sir John Lavery was a Belfast born painter. He was, but he was based in London. He was a friend of Michael Collins and he painted Collins as he lay in the mortuary chapel in St. Vincent's Hospital in Dublin. Now the viewing of the body in St. 
in St. Vincent's Hospital was prior to him laying in state for the public to view. And the viewing of the body in this chapel, it was open only to friends and um, to colleagues and to members of Collins's family. So very few people were admitted to it. Um, of course, his laying in state was open to the public for three days in City Hall and it was visited by thousands of mourners. But when Lavery was painting him in St. Vincent's Hospital Chapel, the bandage was still wrapped around Collins's head. And um, when he was laying in state, some of the wounds, um, some of the wounds were still clearly visible. Um, but we don't see that in the finished portrait. Instead, the artist has made alterations to obscure the pragmatic features of death in favour of this sanitised portrait portrayal of the leader resting peacefully. And Lavery's portrait of Collins emphasizes the privilege ac access that he had to the remains. And there are numerous differences between, firstly what's depicted in the painting, also there's differences between how um, Collins looked when he was laying in St. Vincent's Hospital and when he was laying in state here in City Hall. So, for example, the tricolour that was draped around him that we see in the painting, um, when he was laying in state, the tricolour was um, behind the coffin that you can see here. It's just hung upon the wall that, that's flanked, um, flanked by the two soldiers. Also, in his public viewing, um, Collins's hands were visible and they grasped rosary beads. Whereas in the painting, the crucifix that lay on his breast on top of the tricolour, um, um, the, 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 the uh, crucifix was there and the, the tricolour, these didn't exist, um, you know, they, they weren't positioned in the same way when he was laying in City Hall. So Lavery's portrait in death records um, a very pivotal public moment. And his depiction of Collins in the painting isn't how public mourners experienced the viewing of his remains. And in anticipating the national significance of the artwork, Lavery donated the painting to the Irish Free State, where it was formally accepted into the collection of the Municipal Art Collection in 1935. We now know that as the Hugh Lane Gallery at the top of Parnell Street in Dublin. And Lavery's quick decision to paint the dead leader and gift it to the nation is an example of a visual document that's serviceable in, a, in building a public image at a critical time in political struggle. And with Collins's death occurring at the height of the Irish Civil War, the timing and the, the, the political importance of the image didn't escape Lavery because one week after Collins was laid to rest, he arranged a viewing of the portrait in his London studio and it was exhibited shortly afterwards at the Paris Salon. And Lavery's painting featured in the National Gallery of, of Ireland's 2016 exhibition Creating History Stories of Ireland in Art. And this exhibition comprised of 54 paintings that spanned um, from the 17th century to the 1930s that either depicted or were inspired by episodes in Irish history. So it started with the arrival of St. Patrick right up to the establishment of the Irish Free State. And the exhibition was held in the Bait Wing. It was split across five rooms and it had five overarching themes. And these were testimony, assembly, conflict, allegory and lamentation. And many of the artworks on display including Lavery's depiction of Michael Collins, confront death in a very obvious way. And several of the paintings in this lamentation section, um, which of course means a passionate expression of grief or sorrow, um, the, the layout of many of the paintings in the lamentation section mirrored the series of actions involved in the performance of death. So we have the anticipation of death, um, assembling for funerals, reposing, transporting remains, celebrating and finally commemorating the dead. And another of the paintings in the Creating History exhibition was Come Rest in This Bosom by Augustus, Le Augustus Leopold Egg. And this depicts Robert Emmett being comforted by his fiancée Sarah Curran in his prison cell on the night before his execution. 
Now, Emmett was one of the leaders to emerge from the 1798 rebellion. He led the rebellion against British rule in 1803, 1803, after which he was captured, tried and executed for high treason. Now, there is no evidence to indicate that Emmett would, was visited by Sarah Curran in Kilmainham jail, but he did write a letter to her from prison dated the 8th of September 1803. So the pathos of this subject appealed to the artist who overlooked the matter of historical accuracy in the interest of drama and sentimentality. And Brendan Rooney writes an essay about this painting in the publication that accompanies the Creating History exhibition. And um, he observes that the creative license exercised by the artist here is consistent with the generally romanticized representation of Emmett um, and of a hero for lost causes. So in representing death in exhibitions, the anticipation of imminent death can provide poignant rem reminders of the sacrifice of those involved in the struggle for an independent Ireland. So whenever there's a mention of sacrifice, Museum narratives must above all clarify beyond any doubt that the purpose was worth the price. So whether discussing Robert Emmett or Porrick Pierce or Kevin Barry, it is the eventual realization of their objective in achieving independence from British rule that allows their sacrifice, their executions and their subsequent martyrdom to become a significant part of the national story. So only in death were their actions valorized and commemorative exhibitions continue to emphasize the sorrow of their sacrifice in pursuit of independence. And in doing so, their prominent position in the national narrative of the Irish Re Revolution is justified. So had the Irish Revolution not achieved its, its objective eventually, Museum narratives of these individuals would likely be considerably less sympathetic towards their actions and their subsequent death, and perhaps their stories would be non-existent in national narratives and in commemorative exhibitions. So just going back to Collins, in the immediate aftermath of his death at Bail in August 1922, there was a series of conscious commemorative actions beginning to take place so as we saw, photographs were taken of his remains, a death mask was created, and artefacts were carefully safeguarded by those close to him, but they were also opportunist opportunistically collected by those who encountered Collins' remains. So here we see um, a flag that's in the National Museum's Easter Week collection, and this is the flag that draped his body on the journey from Bail na Bla to Shanakiel Hospital. So this is the white field flag with the red cross and that was kept by one of the ambulance crew. And here we see a photograph of Collins's funeral, which took place in Dublin almost a week after his assassination. His assassination. Um, this is the horse-drawn procession that was led on the streets of Dublin by Free State soldiers. And we can see the tricolour um, draping the coffin. Now, one of the chief mourners at the funeral was Helena Collins, his sister, also known as Sister Mary Celestine. And she left her home in, Clonac in Clonacilty in August 1901 to join a convent in Hull, and she never saw her brother alive again. She returned to Ireland to attend his funeral, and there she was presented with the silk tricolour that draped the coffin. And we can see her holding the, um, the, the, the flag here in the photograph. So Sister Mary Celestine took the flag back with her to Hull and she later presented it to the Church of Apparitions in Parai Lamonial in France. So I do hope to brush up on my Leaving Cert French and get in touch with um, the, the uh, personnel in that church to see if the flag um, still exist, uh, exists within their collection. And um, as I said, there's lots, uh, there's, a, there's quite a large body of objects relating to Collins's death. Um, for example, there's a coin that's said to have been found in the pocket of his coat after his death. And um, this was publicly displayed for the first time in James Stevens' barracks in County Kilkenny in 20, 2014. Um, and the coin was believed to have been given to a Free State soldier, Dermot Murphy, by Collins' sister after his death. But the coin is currently owned by the mother of a serving soldier in Kilkenny Army, 
army barracks. And the cutlery that is said to have been used by Collins when, when he died at the Eldon Hotel in Skibbereen, hours before his death, remains in a private collection. It was presented to his fiancée Kitty Kiernan as a, as a memento, who later passed it on to her sister Maud. So this hasty collection of artefacts indicates not only a conscious awareness of the significance of the historical moment of Collins's death, but also an awareness of the, the need to create a body of material objects for his future commemoration. So the acquisition, the circulation and the eventual display of these objects demonstrates the powers invested in these objects through his touch. So here is a display of the great coat that Collins was wearing when he died. And um, that's also beside um, the uniform of Liam Lynch, which, which he wore when he died as well. These are on display in Collins Barracks um, in the Soldiers and Chiefs exhibition. And Collins's great coat was donated to the National Museum by the Irish government in January of 1923. And it has since become a central object in representing Collins and the Civil War in material form. And the way that these, um, the, 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 this clothing um, is displayed, um, that they're on he headless mannequin, mannequins. And this can be a very effective way of focusing attention on the clothing. But it also provides a very discomforting view into the empty hollows inside the, the, the necklines and the armholes. So the form and the degree of emptiness and the absence of the men that wore these clothing um, places emphasis on the fact that the body, the bodies and the eyes that saw the Civil War are no longer present. So this mode of display also, um, exempt, also represents uninhibited dress. So it, it can evoke a sense of death and loss through the way that it's constructed in this um, in, in this present day um, way of practice of display. So because clothing is imprinted with the shape, with the size, and even with the odor of the lived body, it has a very deep power of immediacy. And this can be effective in momentarily bridging the separation between the living and the dead. So um, this is the room where Collins lay in uh, Shanakeel Hospital after his death. And you can see the, the great coat draped um, beside the bed there, um, just almost le looks as if he, he left it there himself. Um, and again, this was a very opportunistic way of recording Collins's death. Um, this photograph was taken by one of the doctors in Shanakeel Hospital. It was actually his room um, that he's laying in and the doctor happened to have a camera in his wardrobe. And that's how uh, we have these, these photographs. But um, the uniform that Collins was wearing when he died, this tunic, um, it, 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 Anne Dolan writes how the, the uniform was taken to Argentina by a doctor from Shanakeel Hospital. Now, I'd love to know um, the, the whereabouts of that, uh, of that tunic, of that uniform now, but I've no idea where to start. Um, so, so the tunic is uh, a long way from Bail and the Blah, but um, there still is some traces of his uniform. Um, so in the National Collection is a button from that tunic. And this is the last item. Uh, relating to Collins that, that, that I want to talk about. And it's um, a commemorative blanket. Um, and this was produced by Foxford Woolen Mills um, in the last couple of years in conjunction with the Michael Collins House in Clonakilty. And the uh, website um, promoting um, the, the purchase of this commemorative blanket states how the blanket is inspired by a travel blanket that was presented to Collins in 1922 by Foxford Woolen Mills to mark his appointment to the uh, position of Commander-in-Chief of the newly established Irish Army. The rug was in his, or the blanket was in his armoured car at the ambush in Bail and and it was used to wrap his body for transportation to Cork. It was recovered at Shanakeel Hospital by Nurse Nora O'Donoghue and it was later donated to the National Museum of Ireland. Now, I can't find any record 
for the provenance of the blanket, of the original blanket outside of the promotional material um, for the blanket, which by the way, um, doesn't come cheap. It's retailing between 120 and 150 euro um, in shops like Kilkenny Shop, Brown Thomas and various gift shops um, around the country. Um, and I have um, explored the, um, national, the, the, the National Museum's collections for this blanket. Um, and to date, I haven't found a record. But um, Patrick Tuig's book, The Dark Secret of Bail and Blah, records the blanket as being donated to the museum in 1965. Now, I haven't exhausted all avenues on um, finding the original blanket, but I do hope to find some answers soon. But when I was looking in um, our collections, I did come across this blanket of the same um, check pattern of green, white and yellow. And this is um, the wool rug that was used by Father Willie Doyle in the trenches while he served as chaplain for the 16th Division and um, the 16th Irish Division on the, Bel on the Belgian front at World War I. Now, Father Willie Doyle was born in Dalkey in Dublin and after two year service, um, he was killed in the Battle of Passchendaele in August of 1970, 1917. And this, this blanket or this rug is um, in the Nash Museum as part of the collection of items belonging, him, belonging to him that was returned to the Jesuit community from the trenches after his death in 1917. Um, but as this is a new finding, I've yet to determine whether Father Willie Doyle's blanket is a Foxford Woolen Mills one. But I did uncover that Father, Doyle, Father Willie Doyle did conduct a retreat in Foxford in Easter of 1913 as part of, renewal, of a renewal of faith and devotion in the area. So perhaps he may have purchased or been gifted um, the blanket um, while he was in Foxford then. Um, but I was really struck by the um, similarities between uh, Father Willie Doyle's blanket and um, the design of the, um, the commemorative one, which was inspired by, by, by a Foxford Woolen Mills blanket. So once I do track down the Collins blankets, um, the, the original Con Collins blanket, um, I want to compare the two visually and then perhaps more forensically um, through artifact analysis um, using both primary and, and, and secondary sources. So we're going to move from the Civil War back to the 1916 Rising. And this is the bloodstained vest that was among James Connolly's possessions in Kilmainham Jail that was returned to his family after his death. And these included um, the, his vest, his shirt, a watch and his wallet. And this is the vest um, and it's soiled with a, a bloodstain on the back of the left arm, which marks the location of one of the wounds that he received um, in the early days of the Rising. Now, this isn't a, it, it's unlikely that this is an object directly associated with his death, but the way in which it's displayed in um, the museum, which, which I'll get to a little bit later, um, does um, display it as an artifact associated with his execution. But it's unlikely that he wore this, this vest um, during his execution, as it was stated by witnesses that he was wearing only his pajamas and that he lost a lot of blood after the shots were fired. Now, as Jane Tynan discusses, the, the peculiar dynamics of the Rising demanded a relaxed attitude to uniform. So due to financial hardship, um, a lack of military experience and the chaotic unfolding of the events, the majority of, of participants in the fighting had a casual and unmilitary appearance. The leaders of the Rising, however, were noted for wearing uniforms which were dark green in colour and distinct from other volunteers in uniforms. But the Nash Museum's centenary exhibition um, reinforced this unheroic image of the leaders in order to elicit powerful emotional responses from viewers of their exhibitions. So this is the vest on display. And as you can see, it's carefully laid out um, almost as if it's untouched since Connolly last wore it. And I think that heightens its symbolic potency. So the way that the garment is folded in half with the arms crossed at the front, it, it, it resembles the positioning of the arms of a deceased body. 
So rather than putting the vest on a life-size mannequin at eye level, um, such as the, the uniforms of Liam Lynch and of Collins that we saw earlier, um, it's, it's been folded and placed in a glass countertop display case. And that's been done for two reasons. Firstly, to evoke the absence of the deceased body. And secondly, to explicit, explicitly expose the blood stain. And there's a real importance to leaving um, stains on, text on textiles like this, leaving them untouched because these stains contain con considerable historical and cultural evidence. So traces of use on embedded objects such as this blood stain are what arguably authenticate um, these artifacts, rendering them true to their, to their owner, to their original user. So this bloodstained vest um, shows how an exhibition display has embraced the complex and the conflict ridden and tragic spectrum of a historic moment in the past. And this vest itself is freighted with dramatic consequences and its display invokes in the viewer an absence that is most definitely that of death. It's also important to remember that it's a vest, so it wasn't intended to, it wasn't intended by the user to be made visible, and um, certainly not to um, thousands, thousands of museum visitors, um, because it's presumed to have been worn underneath a uniform. Um, so it's the subsequent custodians of the vest, so Connolly's families, and later on um, the Nash Museum, who, and, and it's their practices, that now control the cultural visibility of the vest after Connolly's death. So it's the practices of collection, of conservation, of curation, and of display which which make the uh, which make the shirt the the vest visible. Um, there's another bloodstain artifact belonging to James Connolly in the National Collection that you might be familiar with. This is his shirt. Um, and this was featured, this again is in the, the Soldiers and Chiefs exhibition, and it was featured in the History of Ireland in 100 Objects Initiative, which began as a column by Fintan O'Toole in the Irish Times, it, and it culminated in an illustrated book, a website, and a series of stamps. So given that the power of the rising lay in its symbolism as much as in its strategy, the display of the undershirt is symbolically potent. So, and I think that's made even more so by the way in which the arms are outstretched, almost resembling a crucifixion. But the presentation of the artifact in the museum display has had an effect on other visual interpretations of the artifact. So this is a painting by Rita Duffy. And the painting featured in 1916 in Contemporary Art, that was an exhibition at the Crawford Art Gallery that also toured to Galway City Museum and other museums as well. And this was an exhibition of personal artistic interpretations by contemporary art artifacts that provide a multiplicity, a multiplicity of responses to the turbulent year that was 1916. So this is Rita Duffy's um, contribution to the exhibition and it, it continues her research into the history of clothing within the context of Irish history. So we can see Connolly's shirt floating as a spectral presence over an unfinished house and a figure fleeing it. But she has inter she's interpreted the image directly from the display in the National Museum of Ireland, confirming how outside of the, conf the confines of the museum wall, this shirt has a semiotic value, which is assumed to align with the continuing struggles of the nation. And the Connolly's shirt has been used to motivate learning and it has become significant beyond, beyond its material physical self. So this is a reinterpretation of the undershirt um, by students in St. Gabriel's National School in Dublin. And this was part of a collaborative education project between DIT's Access and Civic Engagement Department and the National Museum. So students visited the National Museum commemorative exhibitions, researched and then researched an object related to the rising. So they chose um, Connolly's shirt. And I think um, their reinterpretation of it, this artwork, 
highlights again the, the the symbolism of the display of the blood of the bloodstained clothing and shows how traces of use humanize and also dramatize the events of 1916 in a material way. So on the Friday evening of April 28th, 1916, when the rebels found themselves trapped in a small area surrounded by British troops, Michael O'Rahilly, also known as the O'Rahilly, led a breakout attempt, but his force was cut down on Moore Street by heavy British fire. O'Rahilly fell mortally wounded at the intersection of Sackville Lane and Moore Street and lay dead for a number of hours before his body was recovered. He had the opportunity to write a final note to his wife and the last two paragraphs of it read, tons and tons of love, dearie, to you and the boys and to Nell and Anna. It was a good fight anyhow. Please deliver this to Nanny O'Rahilly, 40 Herber Park, Dublin. Goodbye, darling. So the anticipation, this anticipation of death is a performance that not many and certainly not everyone is bestowed with. But when it occurs, imminent death is usually contemplated through letters like this, through statements, through um, material artifacts, which subsequently enter the public domain through witness statements and through next to kin donating these to museums. And in, 90, in the 1950s, Sackville Lane, where O'Rahilly um, died, was renamed O'Rahilly Parade. And in 2005, this sculpture was un unveiled in the laneway where his body was found. It's sculpted in limestone and bronze by Shane Cullen, and it's an accurate reproduction of O'Rahilly's own handwriting. Now, I want to stay with the idea of this anticipation of death um, just for a moment. Um, and in a recent podcast, comedian and presenter Tommy Tiernan was asked how he would like to be remembered after he dies. And his reply was, sure, that's none of my business. And he's right to a degree in that the dead have limited control over how they are remembered publicly after their death. Um, however, how a person or how history will be remembered is quite often anticipated. And memory can precede history because as an event is unfolding, it's understood and interpreted through reference to memories of previous events. And Guy Bynum refers to this anticipation as pre-memory. So the anticipations and expectations of those who are committed to predetermine how history will be remembered. So if we think even now, as we're negotiating um, COVID-19, you know, you'd often hear people saying in years to come, we'll remember this time as a time when X, Y, Z. So, you know, we're, we're constantly um, anticipating how we, what we, we might remember this time. And this pre-memory suggests the simultaneous existence of history and memory, which is motivated by, motivated by a strong testimonial urge to control how the past will be remembered. It forms part of these narratives of nationalism in its, re in its reinforcement of the anticipatory sacrifice of the executed leaders of the 1916 Rising. And the Proclaiming a Republic exhibition in the National Museum presents this theme of uh, pre-memory through displaying the last possessions and the last letters of the executed leaders. Um, so this display um, comprises of a photograph, a material artifact and a document relating to each of the executed leaders. Um, so the documents are in the drawers underneath. Um, these, these were death certificates and last letters. Um, they had to be kept in the drawers for, conser for conservation reasons. But many of the artifacts on display, you can see the um, you can see Connolly's vest there on the right hand side. Many of them were objects which um, were gifted to loved ones during their last visits um, to um, Kilmainham Jail. And um, the, um, the these the display elevates these everyday objects belonging to the deceased. Um, to physical embodiments that link the past and the present in a concrete and a very palpable way. 
So in exhibiting these pre-memory artifacts, the private and personal belongings of the deceased are transformed into enduring material testimonies of the despair of conflict. And pre-memory artifacts are centered on their connection with the deceased prior to death. And amongst, also in the display, um, besides the photographs of the, of the leaders are um, photographs of their loved ones left behind. So of, of their mothers, of their wives and children and family. Um, and these photographs play a particular role in shaping sympathetic, sympathetic narratives. So um, it's, it's an attempt to evoke sympathy. And Dara Gannon um, contends that in the immediate aftermath of the executions, the beatification of the dead of 1916 persisted through the publishing of obituary biographies of those who had been killed as a result of the rising, along with photographs of the widows and of the children left behind. So the Catholic Bulletin was crucial in this beatification as it was notoriously sympathetic to the cause of the rebels. And the events of Easter week was a series of artifacts that featured in the magazine from July 1916 right up until March of 1919. And um, these articles featured testimonial accounts and biographies as well as the Catholic and social aspects of the lives and the last moments of those who died. Orla Fitzpatrick affirms how the layout of these articles in the Catholic Bulletin utilised designs known to readers from their own domestic photograph albums and by doing so assured readers that the bereaved families were just like them and this countered negative press depictions of the rebels. Fitzpatrick also explains how the photographs in the, in the Catholic Bulletin were used with religious language and notions of martyrdom in order to elevate the leaders to near saint-like positions. So presenting the respectable life stories of the deceased in the Catholic Bulletin did come at an expense and that expense was the personal attitudes of those um, left behind, namely um, the women um, that were left behind. So some of these, some of the women um, would assume very public roles because of their losses and um, because they were depicted through these articles as grieving wid widows and mothers, irrespective of their achievements um, politically um, or any of their achievements subsequent um, to the 1916 Rising. And the Catholic Bulletin concealed the complexity of these women's backgrounds and, pre and instead presented a uniform picture to readers in order to elicit sympathy. It also disregarded the actions and the achievements of the bereaved women in their role, in the role that they played in preserving the memory of these leaders. So um, Nellie Jiffer Donnelly in particular would have been, um, would have been central in uh, preserving the memory of, of the 1916 Rising and in particular the material memory. Um, she used a lot of her personal connections um, in, in the years following the rising to, um, to attain um, objects relating to the conflict and that, that later became um, what we now know uh, as the Easter collection that we use today. But we also must remember that not everyone dies a heroic death during conflict. And this is a really important point and it's something that Declan O'Doherty, a PhD student in Queen's Uni University Belfast is working on. He's doing really fascinating and important research on the post-traumatic stress in the post-revolutionary period. And it's really, really crucial to acknowledge the psychological impact of conflict and the, just, the, the distressing memories that that can bring. Um, I'm always struck by the lyrics of the um, the, the band played Waltzing Matilda. It's, a, it's, it's an anti-war song by Eric Bogle um, and, and, and Liam Clancy does a, a, a fabulous cover of it. But I'm always struck by the lyrics, um, never knew there were worse things than dying. Um, so um, we must also not just acknowledge that those that died as a result of, of conflict, but also those that survived and um, had to contend with um, massive the massive psychological impact um, of the war. Um, 
So this is a painting of Countess Markovic on her deathbed and it's, it was painted by her husband. Now she died at the age of 59 in July of 1927 of complications related to appendicitis. And this painting is an example of anticipatory grief. And this is the act of memorializing individuals before bereavement. Um, so this relates to a wider concept of mourning, mourning as an ongoing process that starts with the earliest experiences of separation um, from significant others. And this painting was brought to my attention in the National Gallery of Ireland's 2018 exhibition, Markovic Portraits and Propaganda. And the exhibition aimed to broaden understandings of a familiar yet mysterious figure in Irish history. The exhibition offered a nuanced picture of Markovic through photography, through painting and through illustration. And the pieces were juxtaposed to demonstrate the breadth of Markovic's representation over time and in their different media. And this painting in particular presents a fragile Markovic from the strong and confident individual with which we have become familiar. And the exhibition um, encompassed um, the centenaries of the parliamentary vote for women in Ireland and of the first doll of which Markovic was an elected member. But given the breadth of representations in the exhibition, um, I, was, I, I, I was disappointed with how official government sources continue to portray Markovic in a most feminine and glamour, glamorous manner. So this is the Doll 100 website and it's a dedicated website to learn about the first doll and its centenary. As you can see, it has photographs of the male TDs in military or suit attire. Um, but Markovic is pictured wearing a ball, a ball gown in a photograph that was taken 10 years prior to it. So this to me demonstrates visually that despite women developing a strong voice during this decade of centenaries and, you know, the, the women, the, these historical narratives have moved more towards gender inclusivity, but this to me demonstrates that it's complicated and there are a number, there's a number of normative and practical issues that are yet to be resolved in the decade of centenaries. Um, so I'm going to finish up now and to conclude, um, I, I, I hope I've demonstrated that the emphasis on the physical pro proximity to death, um, th these artifacts and artworks that I've spoken about function not only as material reminders of, of an embodied li living person, but also as a means through which, which the past is presented and understood. And although these objects are morbid and directly associated with death, they're donated to the museum in the hope of give, giving them a new life within public consciousness. The cultural memory of the Irish Revolution is organised around notions of martyrdom, which justifies the sacrifice of individuals for the national cause. What often characterises museum displays of this period is that death is in, interpreted as an act of heroic virtue, and there are little questions as to whether did the deceased had any doubt or any fear of death. So therefore, the way in which the narrative is presented in museums, the emphasis is, is on what is perce perceived as the ideal fight for independence without deeper reflection on the detrimental consequences of their actions, such as the death of civilians, the destruction of homes and of cities, not to mention an era of bloodshed and violence. And I think in particular, the execution of the 1916 leaders and the assassination of Michael Collins, um, the manner of their deaths means that the, cul the culpability of their actions is often overlooked and instead replaced with a lamentation of their deaths and a gratitude for their sacrifice. And thus their deaths, are, their deaths often override the complexity of their actions during the Irish Revolution. But nevertheless, museums are really important spaces where the past is performed, where it's imagined and where it's visualised. Museums have extraordinary stories to tell through their collections. And the Decade of Centenaries has offered an opportunity for museums to revisit foundational myths and shared identities through rethinking their collections 
and how they represent the last moments of Irish revolutionaries. Gurmila Mahagrev. <laughs>